these days, it seems, wherever we look in America, our democracy is under attack, not just from politicians, but from judges too. Our ballot access is being undermined. Our election results are being wrongly questioned. Our rights are being taken away. Hate in many forms is on the rise. And day after day, we keep learning just how close we already came to having lost our democracy entirely. At Tuesday's emergency hearing, star witness Cassidy Hutchinson, a former aide to White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, shared explosive testimony before the January 6th Select Committee. Testimony that revealed, among other things, that Trump knew the mob on 1-6 was armed, was fine with them being armed, and wanted to join the mob as it headed for the Capitol. Jaws dropped upon hearing from Hutchinson that Trump lunged at the clavicle of his head security agent for refusing to bring the president to the Capitol on January the 6th, or that an irate Trump threw his lunch across the room, leaving ketchup smeared on the walls when his attorney general, Bill Barr, publicly rejected claims of widespread voter fraud. Not surprisingly, perhaps, there is pushback now against Hutchinson. A source close to the Secret Service tells NBC that the lead agent and the driver present during the alleged incident are prepared to testify under oath that neither of them was assaulted and Trump never lunged for the steering wheel. Let's see if that testimony actually happens. Another source says that Tony Ornato, the person Hutchinson says told her about the incident in the car, is also willing to say under oath that it didn't happen. Onato is the Secret Service agent who Donald Trump promoted and gave a White House job to. Pretty unprecedented. He seems pretty close to Trump. Still, some Republicans are keen to dismiss all of Hutchinson's damning testimony, calling much of it hearsay. It wasn't. But for the sake of argument, fine. Let's put to one side all of the things Hutchinson said she heard about secondhand and didn't witness herself. And let's just focus on all the things she did hear and see for herself. And judge for yourself... How utterly shocking and significant her testimony still is. I recall hearing the word Oath Keeper and hearing the word Proud Boys closer to the planning of the January 6th rally when Mr. Giuliani would be around. I remember looking at him saying, Rudy, could you explain what's, what's happening on the 6th? Uh, he, he had responded something to the effect of, we're going to the Capitol. It's going to be great. Mr. Cipollone said something to the effect of, please make sure we don't go up to the Capitol, Cassidy. Keep in touch with me. We're going to get charged with every crime imaginable. We had conversations about potentially obstructing justice or defrauding the electoral count. Tony and I went in to talk to Mark that morning. Tony just got right into it. I was like, sorry, I just want to let you know and had informed him. like. This is how many people we have outside the mags right now. These are the weapons that we're known to have. It's possible he listed more weapons off that I just don't recall. And I remember distinctly Mark not looking up from his phone. I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Take the effing mags away. Let my people in. They can march to the Capitol from here. Let the people in. Take the effing mags away. And I remember Pat saying to him something to the effect of, the rioters have gotten to the Capitol, Mark. We need to go down and see the president now. And Mark looked up at him and said, he doesn't want to do anything, Pat. Ms. Hutchison, did White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows ever indicate that he was interested in receiving a presidential pardon related to January 6th? Ms. Meadows did seek that pardon. Yes, ma'am. So, to reiterate, thanks to Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony, bits of it you, that you just saw, we now know that Trump encouraged the crowd to march on the Capitol, knowing they were armed. He wanted the metal detectors taken away. We know that Meadows was indifferent about the crowd growing violent at the Capitol on 1-6. His spokesman is now denying that he sought a pardon. We know that White House counsel Pat Cipollone worried about exposure to prosecution if Trump went to the Capitol. None of that is so-called hearsay or a second-hand account. It's explosive eyewitness testimony from a former White House staffer and Trump loyalist. All of it creates a damning, stunning account of exactly what Trump and those around him knew and did on January the 6th. As New York Magazine puts it, Hutchinson shows Trump's complicity in the attack on the Capitol. The standard MAGA account of Trump as an innocent bystander of the January 6th violence is nearly as big a lie as the stolen election fable that underlay the whole effort. As Watergate special prosecutor Jill Winebanks told me after the hearing on Tuesday, there's enough laid out in that hearing just from Hutchinson's testimony, to charge the former president with a crime. And that should happen as soon as possible. 
We'll see if Teflon Trump ever gets his due. But even if he does get indicted or prosecuted, even if he's imprisoned, the threat to our democracy doesn't go away. Because what Trump did was to exploit and exacerbate the existing defects in our democratic system. Take the Supreme Court, even before Trump came along, unelected justices led by Chief Justice John Roberts were whittling away our voting rights. And on Tuesday, while most of us were distracted by the emergency hearing in Congress, the six conservative justices on the highest bench in the land used the so-called shadow docket to uphold Louisiana's GOP-created congressional map, a map struck down by lower courts who found it in violation of the Voting Rights Act. This is a map that packs the state's black voters, a third of the total population, into a single district. But the Roberts Court is letting that, many would argue, racially discriminatory measure stay in place for these upcoming midterms. Voting rights be damned, racial equality be damned. This is a Supreme Court that is doing hugely unpopular things, going after abortion rights, Miranda rights, gun safety legislation, the separation of church and state, many of the rights and freedoms we have come to cherish. So this is an existential moment for American democracy that we're in right now. Is it outrageous that Trump may have assaulted his own Secret Service detail? Yes. And we'll see if any of them deny that on the record and under oath. But we should be much more outraged about Trump's assault on our democracy, the Supreme Court's assault on our democracy, the Republican Party's assault on our democracy. And so we have to ask two questions that I often ask on this show. What are the Democrats going to do about it? And where, oh, where is Merrick Garland? Joining me now, Brian Fallon, co-founder and executive director of Demand Justice, former spokesperson for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. He also worked on public affairs for the Obama Justice Department. Michelle Goldberg, New York Times columnist and MSNBC political analyst. And Rena Shah, veteran GOP strategist and founder of Republican Women for Biden. Thank you all for joining me. Brian, let me start with you. Jill Weinbanks of Watergate fame says there's enough evidence to investigate and even charge Trump. Do you agree with that? And question, where is your old department, the DOJ, on all of this? I agree with her assessment. And I think, you know, Maddie, going back several years, there has been such a person sort of pulled the trigger Hoping that more recommendation. I think, Brian, we're gonna, Brian, we're gonna try and come back to you. I'm, sa I'm sure you're saying wise words, but we're not hearing your audio. Well, I'm not clearly. So we're gonna try and fix your audio and come back to you in a moment. Uh, I'm gonna go to Michelle next and say, Michelle, Trump was impeached, though not convicted for his role in the insurrection, but there were no witnesses in that trial. We didn't hear the stuff. We've heard from Hutchinson, from other witnesses up until now. I remember Chris Coons, senator from Delaware, was pushing his fellow Democrats to drop witnesses so they could get home by Valentine's Day. I mean, I just look back on that and I think, how has it taken this long to find out such damning stuff? Well, look, I think there was a defensible argument that Trump had to be impeached quickly, although really he should have been impeached much more quickly than he was. He should have been, you know, yes. they should have started impeachment proceedings on the night of January 6th or the morning of January 7th. And what we knew at the time was more than sufficient for an impeachment, if not for a criminal inquiry. I think it's been remarkable what they've revealed so far. I went into these hearings. Yes as I've written, with a sense of dread, a sense that it would spotlight the sort of egregious misbehavior and, you know, kind of seditious conspiracy that I think we all know about. And because there would likely be no consequences, it would just reinstate or reinforce Donald Trump's impunity. But instead, we're learning that even those of us whose opinion of Donald Trump was, you know, even if our opinion of Donald Trump was like extraordinarily low, extraordinarily low, even if we thought he was in every way responsible for January 6th, that it, it's our opinion still wasn't low enough, right? He's more responsible yeah. than even I think many of his worst critics understood in terms of the direct planning, the direct knowledge that there was armed people, the direct encouragement of armed people going to the Capitol. Something I thought we learned yesterday that was really interesting 
We all know that Donald Trump, it's been reported at least that Donald Trump, um, when he heard about the chant, the hang Mike Pence chants, said something to the effect of, you know, maybe he should be hung or that he deserves it or something, something yeah. like that. I don't think, believe that we knew before yesterday that it was right after he said that, that he sent out that tweet saying Mike Pence refuses to do what needs to be done, which riled up the crowd against him even further. Yes. It was uh, some severe incitement on Trump's part. And hearing the stuff about my people won't hurt me, they're not here to hurt me. I, was, I found that a chilling line, implying that they are there to hurt someone else. Uh, Rena, there are some Republicans uh, defending Cassidy Hutchinson, Sarah Matthews, a deputy press secretary in the Trump administration, said anyone downplaying her is attempting to discredit her because they're scared of how damning this testimony is. Former White House chief of staff Mick Mulvaney tweeted, I know her, I don't think she's lying. But how much will this really change the mind of Trump's supporters? It won't, will it? I mean, Trump is suggesting she was a nobody and didn't have much power and she's bitter. But she worked in the White House. She was a loyalist up until January the 6th, 2021. Well, look, Mehdi, I think one thing we learned from Cassidy's testimony is how fragile democracy is and how it takes good principled people to stop our most evil actors from doing what could really not just hurt us individually, but the country as a whole. And so on that day uh, of, of how she laid out the events of the West Wing, which she was not just some fly on the wall, she was part of the heartbeat of the West Wing. And most people outside Washington don't know how Washington works in this way. I, as a, a young staffer, just 10 years ago, around 10 years ago, I was in her position on Capitol Hill, tasked with letting members of Congress know that this is either a good decision or this is a bad decision. Here's the information you need to know. And one of the biggest lines that really struck me was, he needed to care. And she was, of course, referencing her direct boss, Mark Meadows, the chief of staff. And, and th in, in her head, you could hear that sort of inner battle she had. So somebody that was clearly able to decipher right from wrong in that moment and was maybe even flabbergasted and frustrated, as she also said, that he was so passe in the moment. The chief of staff to the president of the United States was willing to let the vice president, someone he served yeah. in Congress with. Okay, Mark Meadows and Mike Pence were bros together in Congress. I remember witnessing it myself. And he was ready to let that guy potentially be hung and not put himself in the way. Yet this 25-year-old woman was willing to. So I think it's great that Mick Mulvaney and some other peers of hers, former peers, came out and said that, look, this is a woman that should not be discredited because what does she have to gain from any of this? Why would she lie? There's nothing yes. waiting for her. It, you're, you're more I likely mean, to lose money for speaking out against Trump than earn more money. The, the, the hassle and harassment and threats she's going to get or probably is already getting is clearly evidence that she doesn't need this. Um, and you're right about, I think Meadows is probably the only person aside from Trump who comes out worse uh, from her testimony on Tuesday. Um, Michelle... There was so much to take in from that testimony on Tuesday uh, that some things got overlooked, and I want to bring it up today. We heard video testimony from the former national security advisor to the president of the United States, a former army general, decorated army general, Michael Flynn, who couldn't answer a simple question about the peaceful transition of power. Have a listen. General Flynn, do you believe in the peaceful transition of power in the United States of America? That's fair. The fifth. What do you mean the fifth? It's a simple yes or no question. I mean, how dire a state is our democracy, and especially on the right of the political spectrum, when a general can't just say yes? Well, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up, because I also thought that was one of, you know, one of many shocking moments from yesterday. And it came, there was a series of questions to which he took the fifth, all fairly straightforward. You know, were the rioters justified? He took the fifth. I think, were the rioters morally justified? He took the fifth. And then, do you believe in the peaceful transition of power? He took the fifth. Um, you know, part of that might just be petulance or refusal to cooperate on his part, but part of it may be that he, I mean, imagine thinking that you could be um, somehow incriminated for lying to Congress because you pretended to believe in the most basic principles of democracy. I think it's pretty clear, you know, sort of, who Mike Flynn is and who the MAGA movement is. It's just um, this was, you know, kind of him admitting it for the world. Yes. And I would say this, uh, Rena, the Republican Party 
is clearly spooked by Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony. We're hearing that both on and off the record. We're seeing the attacks on her. There is this obsession now with proving that Trump didn't try and grab the wheel or grab the neck of a Secret Service agent. If that turns out to have been something that she was told falsely, because remember, she testified under oath. The story may have been uh, not accurate when given to her. But that doesn't change the big picture. It's going to be a classic GOP tactic, I'm sorry to say, where they will focus on some small issue to try and discredit the big issue. The big issue is she heard the president of the United States saying, take away the metal detectors, take away the mags. I don't care if they're armed. They're not here to harm me. And even the Secret Service agents who are disputing the story about the wheel are not disputing that Donald Trump wanted to be taken to the Capitol to join this mob and enter the Capitol. There was so much we learned yesterday, Mehdi, and I had to write it down here. One of the biggest takeaways I think we should remember is the strategy that we know that they were trying to employ from Trump's administration all the time. It was to deflect and blame. They wanted to blame Antifa. Cassidy herself revealed that in the testimony is that deflect and blame was part of the strategy on January 6th. So whatever was going down, people erecting spears on the tips of their flags, you know, all that wildness, they were going to go with their tried and true strategy. So again, we know who Donald Trump is, and that's what Republicans always say to me. We know this is a guy who doesn't respect norms or institutions. He wants to tear it yeah. all down, and he wants to serve us. He wants to do it all right for us. Washington's always been this place that has these unelected bureaucrats and it's always felt like a faraway place to a lot of Republicans. That's been the winning message, is that there are these people sitting in Washington who want to control you, and they're going to ruin your way of life, and we're going to come save you from that. But listen, this is that's, yeah. that's, their, that's their playbook. They've won on that. They've been able to sort it of incite this fear in their supporters that continually drives them to the polls and says, I've got to demonize these Democrats. They're horrible for me. They're going to ruin my life. Yeah. But the biggest, biggest problem is that we don't have enough principled leaders. These were men who were much older than Cassidy Hutchinson, who were far I more think we can. Yeah. I, I, think, we I think we can agree. I think we can agree on the, the, the lack of principle in the Republican Party, I think, has been on demonstration for a while, but especially in recent days. Brian Fallon is back. Brian, we missed you. I'm going to ask you the same question again. The AG, Merrick Garland, where is he? And did Joe Biden make a mistake putting him in the Department of Justice instead of someone like Doug Jones, who said this week, that Trump should be charged with a crime? Well, I, I think so, but we are where we are. However, uh, I think that the committee is laying out such a, a trail of breadcrumbs here that it's almost impossible for even Merrick Garland, cautious though he is, for him to not follow up on this. And we're seeing increasing evidence that the Justice Department is starting to um, follow the breadcrumbs. We're seeing raids on senior Trump justice officials' homes. We're seeing seizures of John Eastman's phone. Uh, I think even Merrick Garland, who is constantly worried about the uh, reputational prestige of the Justice Department, worried about Republicans crying foul and crying politics, I think that the compelling evidence that's coming out of these hearings is such that even Merrick Garland, I think, can no longer resist letting the line prosecutors follow this where it leads, which is ultimately to Donald Trump as part of a criminal conspiracy to overturn the election.